The title of the message today, and I have in parentheses, when I first started taking my notes down, I wrote in parentheses, this will not preach. So I'm not sure how you'll receive it. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing, uh, but the title is, You're Fired. And uh, we had some folks in the Torah portion today that were fired from their responsibilities. And we had a... Uh, a couple who were fired from their call to the body because of disobedience. And um, it's important to look at the reasons behind that because so many times this New Testament grace is preached as though it's somehow changed. It hasn't changed. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira. That, that New Testament grace has not quite kicked in with them. So let's, let's go back and as you know, Monday will be a meeting together for the Yom Kippur service. And here is what scripture says about Yom Kippur. On the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. And you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to Adonai. That's Leviticus 23:27. We have to present an offering by fire, and it requires humbling our souls. That's very interesting. Perhaps today we can find out exactly what it means to humble your soul and present an offering by fire so that it will be accepted on the Day of Atonement. Now I'm going to read again a passage that I've read, I think, about every week for the last few times that I've taught. And if you don't have it marked yet in your Bible, go ahead and mark it, because it's really the theme song for Vaikra, for Leviticus. In Deuteronomy 33.1, Now this is the blessing, it's a blessing, it's not a curse, with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai, and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints at Sadiqin. From his right hand came a fiery law, a fiery Torah for them. Yes, he loves the people. He doesn't give you the Torah because he hates you. He gives you the Torah because he loves you. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. We learn the Torah sitting at his feet. Everyone receives your words, your devarim. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. The inheritance of the congregation is that fiery Torah. So today, let's, let's humble our souls. Let's sit at Hashem's feet and let us teach us his fiery Torah. Why don't we sit at his feet? Remember, the feet in scripture represent the Malchut, the kingdom of heaven. And if heaven is Hashem's throne and the earth is his footstool, then the place where his feet rest is the contact point between heaven and earth. It's where the kingdom of heaven can touch the kingdom of earth. And that's why we pray, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May that foothold be established here the same way that it is in the heavenlies. It's the contact point. It also represents when you're talking about feet in scripture, it's recommending to you a kingdom commission. We are all going to be commissioned if we accept that commission 
to be messengers, to be apostles, to be whatever, disciples, whatever that calling is, whatever that commission offer is, that commission is going to be made and it's represented by the feet because it's representing the kingdom of heaven. It's an invitation by the Holy One of Israel to come work in my kingdom. You're following after all the kingdoms of men. You're following after religious kingdoms, political kingdoms, career kingdoms, power kingdoms. You're chasing after things that are not the kingdom of heaven. They're the kingdom of earth. But I'm offering you a commission, if you will accept it, to work in the kingdom of heaven, to advance my kingdom. And he says if we take this yoke upon us that is his kingdom, then how can it possibly overburden us because Yeshua says in Matthew 11 28 come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart he's lowly in heart and he's God himself and he's lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light you see Yeshua offers every man, every woman, every child capable of understanding. He offers each one of us a kingdom commission. And he says this yoke that we will take upon ourselves, the yoke of the kingdom, the yoke of his covenant, is so much lighter than the kingdoms of the world that we chase after, that will burden us, cause severe depression, break down our physical bodies. His kingdom is not like that. And we are so eager to take on those man-made kingdoms. I don't know why we rush out to try to put that yoke around our necks and to buy into those systems because they are not everlasting. Once this body of flesh passes away, what good has that kingdom done you? But what he is offering you is an everlasting kingdom. If you'll put that yoke around your neck, he says you'll find it easy, light, and once this flesh passes away, you still have an everlasting kingdom to walk in. So if we are to be like Mashiach and to accept this kingdom commission, then we must also be humble and lowly of heart and to receive humbly that engrafted word that the congregation received at Hashem's feet at Sinai when he gave them that fiery Torah from his right hand. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I know we hear a lot about saving souls, but do you realize the salvation of your soul is progressive? You still have to keep burning up those appetites and desires that are raging inside of you, and your whole walk with Messiah is learning to subdue those animal instincts. That's what Leviticus is about. Subdue the animal that's within, within you. Subdue the beast. So what does it mean to receive that word with meekness? It means to sit at Yeshua's feet and receive that engrafted word just like a disciple. It's to receive that kingdom commission at his feet, at the point of contact where the heaven and earthly kingdoms meet. To lay yourself upon the brazen altar of Vaikra, of Leviticus, is to imitate Mashiach. You see, he did not have one shred of sin or filthiness to burn up. Nevertheless, when he laid himself on that brazen altar, it was an act of supreme sacrifice. He didn't have to lay himself on the altar. There was nothing to burn up. And so nothing could touch him. He resurrected. The judgment didn't phase him. He didn't even have the smell of smoke on him. We can't say that. When we get up from the altar, we're going to smell a little like smoke because there's still some stuff in our flesh that has to be judged. We want to offer it up willingly with a humble heart and say, yes, I have this inside of me. I'm not proud of it, but I'm going to lay it on this altar. I'm going to be humble and lowly of heart. I'm going to be like my Messiah and lay myself on that altar. I'm going to bring forth works and fruits that show how much I value that sacrifice that he made for me. But it's going to be painful. Because that fire altar, if there's still any shred of the flesh inside of us, that fire's going to burn us. It's going to be unpleasant. But as we learn that fiery Torah, that fiery law, 
it completes that process, the progressive, progressive salvation of the soul part of us. I'm not talking about your spirit here. I'm talking about your soul. Your soul is a bundle of appetites. That's your desires. It's going to burn up and purify those animal instincts inside of you. And that's our goal, to burn out as much of the beast within us as we possibly can before we face the judgment. Because if we face the judgment having let all this stuff burn up at the end of our lives, there's not that much more to burn, right? You've already burned it out. You've let it go. But the more we hold on to ourselves, the more arrogance, pride, lack of humility that we have, the more that's going to be left to burn at the end. And there are comments made about that in the Brit Chadashah. Well, we could look at that some other time. But it talks about who people who will be saved, but it says they're going to smell like smoke when he pulls them out of the fire. They're still going to have the smell of smoke on them. But we want to be like Yeshua. We want to become that korban, that offering, which helps us to draw near to our Father. Remember when we talk about offerings in general, that's korban, and it means to draw near. That's all that an offering means. How do you get close to the Father? You draw close with an offering. In those times, you drew near with an animal. Now we draw near through the blood of Messiah. But when we receive that fiery Torah, we have to humble ourselves like the poor man that we read about the last time. Because... If we can draw near like the poor man who finally landed in Abraham's bosom, that fire was not a fire of torment for him. The fire where he landed to him became a fire of light, a fire of love, a fire of healing. All the bad stuff that happened to him in the kingdom on earth, it was nothing because he was whole. He was purified because he had lifted his eyes. And he had taken hold of the kingdom of heaven. So we have to realize that there is a Torah of life and there is a Torah of death. It all depends on how you approach it. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. If you don't start this journey with the fear of the Lord, something will happen to you that will reinforce the fear of the Lord in your eyes. It's called the Yerat Hashemayim, the fear of heaven. That fear of heaven will come upon you because you need that beginning point of wisdom to learn how to properly evaluate the sacrifices that you're bringing to the altar. We have to start by meekly sitting at Yeshua's feet to hear the teaching and instruction of that fiery Torah, the Word of God. And this is what Aharon and his sons were told in the Torah portion in 9.6. It says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. You see, at this point, they're, they're obeying commands they may not necessarily understand completely yet. They're operating in a lot of faith. They're a little in the dark as to what all this stuff means. There's a lot of slaughtering. There's a lot of blood. There's a lot of washing. You have to do it this way and that way. Details, details, details. What does it all mean? Well, this is what Moses says. You have to do these things the way that you've been commanded, and then the glory of it will be revealed to you. You obey first, and then you'll see the glory. And that's what each of us is called to do. Sometimes we first have to obey the commandment before we really understand what that detail is all about. It may sound silly. Why can I eat this, and I can't eat this? Why do I rest on this day when every day is the Lord's? Why does it have to be this day? But sometimes, even before you understand it all, He calls you to obey the commandment. And He says, then if you'll be faithful, I will reveal my glory to you. Obey first, then you'll see the glory. Sometimes He lets you see the glory first, and then you obey. But sometimes He says, obey first, then I'll reveal my glory to you. So we have to fear the Lord enough to humble ourselves sometimes and do things we don't completely understand, and that's called faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And as you hear this fiery Torah, it will begin to penetrate to you and begin, all of a sudden, there, a light will shine. You say, oh, that's what that was all about. But you did it before you understood there's merit 
and obeying before understanding. And that's operating in the fear of heaven. That will bring the glory down upon you. Now we also read about the breast of the wave offering today. Um, I would love to go through each one of these, and maybe we can a little bit break it down on Monday nights. But the breast and the thigh of the wave offering are significant. We'll just deal with the breast today. I want you, while I'm kind of talking on, go ahead and turn to Luke 18.9. Luke 18.9. And let's look at what this breast of the wave offering actually is. Luke 18.9. Remember the publican? A publican is a tax collector. It's like the IRS. Has anybody ever heard anybody say anything nice about the IRS lately? No. I haven't. <laughs> but the publicans were the tax collectors. They were the IRS of that day. And this publican goes up to the temple and he is so repentant, absolutely so repentant. He's so humble before his Abba that he won't even lift up his eyes. He doesn't feel worthy to lift up his eyes. He's saying, I'm not even worthy to look into the kingdom of heaven. I'm not worthy to have a prophetic vision. I am such a sinner. He just looks down, he beats on his breast, and he repents. He pleads for mercy from his Abba. But it's this very humility that causes him to keep his eyes downcast and to beat his breast in humility and shame for his sin. It's that very humbling of himself that caused him to ascend the heights of holiness. Whoever is abased, he will be lifted up. Luke 18.9 Yeshua spoke also this parable to certain people who were convinced of their own righteousness and who despised all others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a parush, Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Perush stood and prayed to himself like this. Now that's interesting wording. He prayed to himself like this. Now you might have read that before thinking well, he was just like praying the Shemoni or something real quiet. So nobody could hear it. No, it says he prayed to himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, extortioners, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far away, wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is very interesting. These men have come into the temple to pray, which in the second temple times means that they're bringing an offering in. They didn't just go to stand around and have a prayer meeting. They brought a korban offering either of animal, grain, or in the, at this time they could bring money. Money could accompany your prayers. They're bringing in a korban, which means to draw near. And the Pharisee comes in bringing his offering, whatever it may have been, we're not told. But what he's waving as an offering under Hashem's nose is his own works, his self-righteousness. Look at what I did. I give tithes. I'm not an adulterer. I don't extort money. But look at this guy. Have you ever been around somebody that would snitch you out every time? <laughs> it's not good to go pray with people like that. <laughs> but he is. He's waving his own works of self-righteousness. Is this a proper wave offering? No, because it's the breast. It's where your heart beats. This Pharisee, believe it or not, is everything he says he isn't. If you read between the lines, he's all this. Because if you remember, one of the problems with the, at least one of the schools of the Pharisees, it was the Hillel school, was that they had somehow twisted the Torah to legitimize some divorce practices that Yeshua said were adultery. 
He said, if you follow this halakha that they are setting for you, you are committing adultery. You can't divorce one woman in order to go marry another. It's adultery. But over here he's saying, I'm glad I'm not like this adulterer. Well, the Pharisees were setting the rules that said adultery was okay. He was exactly what he said he wasn't. Also, remember the, the Pharisees, some of the religious elite, they had set up these rules. It was called a korban, where they could take some of their wealth, it might be money or goods, and they could say, I'm making this korban. I'm dedicating this money to the temple, like an offering, korban. Well, you could continue to control this money during your lifetime. It was still yours to control, to invest, or whatever. You could still enjoy it. But upon your death, of course, it would go to the temple fund. Now, Yeshua says these greedy people who enjoyed the praise of men so much that they would stick the name of one of God's offerings on this stuff. They were dedicating this stuff to the temple so they wouldn't have to support their elderly parents. Do you really think you can abuse the Torah you can ignore the commandment to honor your father and mother and to support them in their old age. That you can stick the name of a religious offering like Korban on it and bribe Hashem into accepting it as an offering from the heart, from the breast. You can't bribe God. You can't extort Him. He's saying, I'm not an extortioner. Yes, He was. He was part of that system that was extorting money from the people who needed it in order to look good in front of people. Oh, oh so-and-so over there, he's dedicated 20,000 shekels to the temple. Yeah, but what are his parents eating tonight? It's a messed up system when we think that we can elevate ourselves and stick a religious name on it. We cannot make laws, man-made laws, that supersede the Torah, the fiery Torah. It did not make it acceptable. This man was indeed praying to himself. He was his own God. But the tax collector, he acknowledges his sin. He repents humbly in front of everyone. And he doesn't even pretend that he's righteous. He's not even going to play the game. It says that he beats his breast. This is the portion of the wave offering. He's bringing a korban, but his heart is so full of repentance that he won't even draw near, which is the name of the offering. Korban, draw near. It says that he stands afar off. He doesn't even feel worthy to bring this offering in to the altar. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of you. I'm just a sinner. And he beats his breast. You realize that even today, when you're praying the Shemoni Esrei, when you get down to the slicha, which is a, a prayer of repentance, that it's customary for you to beat your breast with a closed fist as an outward sign of a repentant heart. That's still in, in place today. This tax collector was praying a heartfelt prayer because something in his breast was changing. There was repentance. And it was this repentance that caused him to ascend in Yeshua's eyes. Not in the eyes of men, but in Yeshua's eyes. He had humility with repentance. And he realized that the sin that he was committing was sabotaging his kingdom commission. When you sin, you sabotage your commission. You're causing problems. Not just for yourself, but for Israel as a congregation. The Pharisee was elevated in his religious kingdom by arrogance. But the tax collector was elevated in Hashem's kingdom. He was drawn near to that glory, that presence that was promised to the priests that they would obey first, that his glory would be revealed. That is what is revealed to us by our humility. And we know that Hashem knows whether we bring our korban in, our sacrifice, our wave offering of our heart, he knows whether we're waving it under his nose or whether we're beating our breasts in repentance and humility, whether we're bringing it in pride or whether we're bringing it in repentance. Now, like I said, there is a Torah of life and there is a Torah of death. You ever hear anyone say, hey, I got connections? Oh, yeah? 
most likely they're talking about man-made connections. They're talking about kingdoms of the world when they say that. But Yeshua says when we exalt ourselves, that we're bringing forth a Torah of death upon ourselves because we're connected only to that man-made kingdom where our connections are. But if we humble ourselves, and the Torah is a living Torah, then what we are connecting to is the kingdom of heaven. And that's a connection to tap into. So when somebody says, I got connections, ask them what they're connected to. The kingdom of earth or the kingdom of heaven. Remember the feet. That's where we connect. That's where heaven and earth meet. The Mahut. What did Kepha say, Peter, to Sapphira in our Bikhadasha portion? In 5 9 of Acts, it says, Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Now this is very interesting. I know that we know the Torah is absolutely unfathomable to us. We don't have the minds it takes to plumb the depths of Torah. But you know, from an English teacher's perspective, it's literary genius as well. He uses a device here called synecdoche. With synecdoche, we use one part of something to symbolize the whole thing. The purpose for doing that is to draw attention to that one thing and how it relates to the whole. In this instance, Kepha says the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. It was more than just their feet standing, right? There was a body connected to it, right? And he says, these feet will carry you out. Well, that was more than just the feet walking these bodies out. That would have been a sight. But he's using these men's feet to point you to a particular aspect of their body, the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of earth. There's a war going on here with Ananias and Sapphira, and in this instance, they allowed the kingdom of earth to win in their lives over the kingdom of heaven. And so, by this, we've got a very strong picture of feet. What's going on? Because Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, the Torah of life became a Torah of death to them. They were called to discipleship, but they looked back. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back maybe at her family. Who knows what she was looking at? These people also looked back, but they were looking back at their money. They were looking back at their security. They were hedging their bets with this new movement. So, oh, it sounds really good, but I need to hedge my bets. I need to keep a little money back just in case it doesn't go well. And we do that all the time. How much do we hold back from the body of Messiah? Because we're just not sure if this thing's going to go well. But they fell at Kepha's feet. What does that tell us? There is a problem here that leads us to believe that they might have been disrespectful of these specific apostles. They didn't just fall down. It says they fell at Kepha's feet. There's something going on here. Remember, Torah is to be learned at the dust of the teacher's feet. It's a very humbling experience. Mary didn't have any problem with it. Mary just plopped herself right down at Yeshua's feet and said, get me dusty. And you know what? We have to be the same way. We have to humble ourselves. But we are to drink in the dust of a teacher's feet when they are speaking the words of the Torah. This rebellious pair had not yet humbled themselves at Kepha's feet. Not in life. But they did in death. Like Nadav and Avihu that we read about today, they offered strange fire. They tried to enter that Holy Spirit place. Who did they lie to? The Holy Spirit. He said, you've not lied to me. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. They have tried to enter that Holy Spirit place without first offering themselves on that brazen altar of fire. There is a cost before you press into the holy place. 
Do you not think that the Holy Spirit will know if you try to enter that holy place in arrogance? With presumption? Men may not know. We may not know. I may not know what you're thinking. No one in this room may know what you're thinking. But the Holy Spirit knows what's in your heart. And if you try to press in too close without laying yourself on that fiery altar to purge that flesh out of yourself, the Holy Spirit will know. And the penalty for entering that set-apart place, that place of the presence, remember the bread of the presence? It was the presence that was going to be revealed after there was obedience. You first have to be obedient before you can get into that Holy Spirit place. It's interesting because Kepha says, You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Hanania and Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him. Remember last time it was the rich man that was buried. This time it's Ananias who is buried. But great fear came over all who heard about this. This is the same thing that happened with Nadav and Avi. Don't you think the two brothers that were left to serve were serving in fear of heaven? Oh yeah. <laughs> Big fear, respect for the instructions. It says that when Ananias heard these words, in Hebrew words is devarim. It can mean things. It can mean words. It also is the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, which is written in the form of an ancient covenant. So when Ananias heard the words of the covenant, he fell down dead. Once he See, he had not been discerning the body. Once he heard that and his ears were opened up and he heard the words of those, that covenant, he couldn't handle it. Not in this body of flesh. He died. It brought forth a Torah of death. When you hear the covenant, it will either bring forth life or death depending on what's inside of you. It was like the rich man who could only open his spiritual eyes after it was too late and look up and see Poor old Eleazar in Abraham's bosom, and he, you know, he wouldn't cry in God help anymore. It was the rich man crying, God help. In the same case, we've got Ananias who could not open his spiritual ears until it was too late. Until the moment of his judgment, it was too late. And it did. It produced great fear among the congregation and great humility. Judgment produces a renewed respect and fear of heaven, an awareness that God's word must not be handled with deceit or presumption. And it's interesting, too, that just like Nadav and Avihu, in the Torah portion, these people were carried out. It's also, and this is just a little aside, it is believed that Nadav and Avihu were not complete crispy critters once the fire came down because they were carried out in their garments had their bodies, had the whole thing been burned, there wouldn't have been anything to carry, number one. And how could they have carried them on their garments, number two? Um, so you can think about that any way you want to. Some of the rabbinic speculation is that it was not actually the body that was burned, that it, the fire actually came down and pen penetrated and consumed their soul. Remember, it's the soul you really offer on the altar your desires, your appetites, your lusts, your ambitions, that that's what was consumed because that was not completely offered on the altar before they tried to press into that golden altar of incense. So what does this speak to us? What does this have to do with this congregation? Well, I think it's probably the same problem of Messianic congregations everywhere. We're a very small, very new movement. Um, there are Messianic congregations literally all over the world now, but one thing we have in common, most of us are small. Most of us are comparatively new. Most of us have no really strong association backing us up. We are perceived as weak, especially at the leadership level. If you don't believe it, start looking around and trying to find a yeshiva that will ordain Messianic ministers. There's just not that much out there that's available. And you know what? We are weak. In the eyes of man, we are weak. But we have to remember 
the disciples that Ananias and Sapphira were testing at this point were in the same condition. They were new, they were small, and in man's eyes, they were weak. These men were fishermen, tax collectors, common country folk. They didn't have any ordination in the eyes of men that you could say, well, Yeshua ordained them. He commissioned them to go teach and heal. But you know the Pharisees weren't even recognizing that Yeshua was ordained to do or say anything. They said, who ordained you? Who gave you permission to teach in your own name? So they don't have an ordination or an association that any man is going to recognize. All these men could say is that they had walked with Yeshua they had performed miracles in his name and they were commissioned to go and teach that they had his verbal authority to go teach this is not a leadership that any person is going to respect if that person has one iota of his own personal agenda that has not been laid on the brazen altar it's just not in this movement we have a lot of spiritual seekers. You see them move in, move out, move in, move out. If you monitor what's going on in the Israel net, there's a lot of people, they move in, they move out. They're seeking, they're just looking, they're poking around. Is there power in this? I would like to have some of that. But they're not committed to the body. And as they identify us as a young, small, and weak movement, we're going to look like an easy target. Got a big bullseye. Just drawn right on our backs. Easy target, weak leadership, don't know what they're doing, no strong association. Everybody's saying, this doctrine's most important, this doctrine, who cares what name you use? Do you see how that looks so foolish to the world? What you wear, how you observe the dietary laws. We're squabbling over things that are so insignificant so that to the world, well, they're weak, they don't even know what they're doing themselves. Easy target. But if you're called into this movement, if your heart, you're called into this movement, then the Holy Spirit is going to teach you how to lay that flesh aside on the brazen altar so that you can penetrate into the Holy Spirit place and not do it presumptuously. Even in the book of Acts, where they're having this problem with Ananias and Sapphira, the whole book of Acts catalogs this young movement being attacked by spiritual seekers. Remember Simon the sorcerer? I want some of that. How much will it cost me? Remember the seven sons of Sceva? They got hurt because they were trying to enter into this place of discipleship and apostleship presumptuously without allowing the kingdoms of the flesh to be burned on the altar. And that's what we have to be aware of. What's really going on here? In the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they did not respect their leadership. They lied to the disciples about something that was seemingly inconsequential. After all, who cares how much they got for the property? What if they did say, I kept this much back for myself? Would the disciples have said anything bad to them? No. They could have kept it. It would have been okay. If this is how much core bond you want to bring in, and this is what came out of your heart, this is what is accepted. But don't tell me you gave this much and keep this much of your own personal kingdom that you're afraid to let go of and then lie about it. Was this just a nugget of greed that motivated them? I don't think so. I think it had to do with the esteem that they sought with that early congregation. I don't think it was just greed. They wanted position. They wanted men to look at them like the Pharisee and say, oh, how righteous they gave everything they had. We can't seek after the esteem of men instead of humbling ourselves. It will cause us to humble our souls before Hashem if we're called into this. They couldn't have believed that God didn't know they lied. They wouldn't have thought that. But they weren't really concerned about what he thought. They were concerned about what men thought about them. They thought they could lie to the leadership and it not affect their relationship with the Father. But you're wrong. If you lie to the leadership, if you lie to this body, it will affect your relationship with your Abba. 
It can't help but do it. He would be violating His own Word if He allowed you to draw near to Him. If you drew near to us in falsehood and deceit. When we lie to the anointed or ordained leadership against the congregation of Israel, when we rebel against it, we are not rebelling against them as people. It's very clear. Kepha said, you didn't lie to me. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You're rebelling against the Father Himself. You ever hear the, the phrase, don't kill the messenger? But that's our tendency, to want to kill the messenger. Even Moshe reminded the Israelite rebels that they had tested Hashem by rebelling against Him. He was merely the messenger. Moshe was humble. He was not lording it over them. He was not out to get all the tithes and the offerings. He was not padding his own pocketbook. He was doing them good, not evil. But they presumed that they could attack the messenger of the word because he was just a man like they were. Peter was just like man, like Ananias and Sapphira. What went on here? Ananias' name in Hebrew is Hanania, which means whom Yah graciously gave whom Yah graciously gave. Sapphira is Shapira, which means fine, good, or well. And it's also related to the word sapphire. That's where we get sapphire. It's from the Hebrew. And remember, sapphire was the substance of the original stones that the commandments were written on. It was the original substance of the fiery Torah. Interesting. So when the Father gave Yeshua as an offering of grace for the people, that offering was fine, good, and well. Yeshua was that offering of sapphire, that fiery commandment that was given to Moshe, the word to pass on to us. And remember, the elders went up and they sat down on that brickwork, on that pavement of sapphire to receive the fiery Torah, to eat and drink with Hashem. And just as the elders were selected to go up at Sinai, Yeshua offers to every man and woman among us the opportunity to do the same thing. You don't have to be an elder in Israel to sit at the king's throne, to sit on that sapphire pavement of the fiery word and to drink in that word, to eat and drink in the kingdom of heaven. He's offering that commission to every one of us. Elohim is perfect. He withheld nothing good from us because Yeshua was the good, the ultimate good, fine and well gift. Yet Hanania and Shapira held back. While the Father gave us, He prepared a perfect body of sacrifice for us without blemish. Their offering that they brought was blemished because of their hearts. They did not live up to their names. They did not bring offerings of grace that were fine, well, and good, that represented the goodness of that fiery sapphire of the commandments. It's so ironic that Hananiah's name denotes grace, but he didn't necessarily benefit from the graces we've been taught. It's interesting that a three-hour interval passed between the death of the couple. Three in Hebrew is gimel, the camel. And the gimel is seen as the rich man. An elevation. When you're sitting on a camel, you're elevated and you're looking down on everyone else. That's why it's associated with the rich man. If you don't get off your high camel, you'll get knocked off. That's the lesson to Ananias and Sapphira. Strange fire that we read about today. Nadav and Avihu, they didn't live up to their names either. Nadav means he was willing. And Avihu means my father is. While the father was and is willing to give us his only son, to give us a reflection of his presence, of his glory that he promised us for obedience, Nadav and Avihu were not willing to obey. How do we know this? They challenged the authority of Moshe, their uncle Moshe and their father, Aharon, 
to offer strange fire contrary to the instructions. See, our Father was willing to prepare us a fiery Torah, a perfect sacrificial body. But if we are arrogant, like Nadav and Avihu, then that fiery Torah may consume us while we're yet in this body. What sparked, pun intended, the judgment of the Pharisee, Ananias and Sapphira, and Adav and Avihu in the readings today. I think the one guiding principle that we can say caused this fire, this judgment, we learned in the uh, Monday night class, it's the fourth law of interpretation. And we derive this statement, falsehood is the opposite of Torah. Falsehood is the opposite of Torah. How do we know this? Well, we're going to base it on two passages, Psalm 119.29 and 163. Psalm 119.29 says, Remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your Torah. Second witness, I hate and despise falsehood, but I love your law. Falsehood is the opposite of Torah. So if falsehood is the opposite of Torah, then the closer you move to the inner parts of Hashem's sanctuary, the closer you get to the place where those commandments are stored in the Holy of Holies, the closer you get, the more danger you are in if you are approaching in falsehood. Does that make sense? Because these, these two things don't exist together. They can't. Now, remember there's two altars. There's gold and there's brazen. The brazen altar was where we burned up the animal instinct inside us, the flesh, the kingdoms of man we burn up at the outer altar. This involves burning up the head or the will, the feet, the kingdoms of men, organs and fat parts that we read about, as well as the food offerings of grain smeared in oil and the wine. These represent the flesh of man controlled by his soul. And the altar consumes the fat around the organs. Now fat in scripture can represent blessing. Remember it's a Torah of life, but then it's also a Torah of death. It also represents ill temper associated with rebellion against God and his Torah. How do we know that? Psalm 119.70, their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law, in your Torah. You can also look up Deuteronomy 32.15 as your second witness. Fat is equated with rebellion against God's word. So the fat also represents our excesses. What happens when you eat more than you burn up physically? You gain fat. So that is what occurs when we take in excess of what we give out. Remember the lesson of the rich man? He was taking in more than he was giving out to Eleazar, who was sitting at the gate saying, God help me, God help me. The rich man has all this excess. He's getting fat, fat, fat with wealth. Eleazar sitting there with sores with no comfort. So on the brazen altar, we have to learn to put that rich man mentality behind us, put it on the altar, and learn to give out as much as we take in so that we don't become fat around the organs. We have to let that be consumed on the altar, be purged with fire. You're also going to purge the kidneys and the liver. And the kidneys and the liver, of course, are the purifiers of the body. It captures the toxins and it purifies, lets it flow out. And that's what we want to do with sin. We want to capture that sin and let it be purged, let it flow out on that altar. So at the brazen altar of sacrifice, we're going to burn up the impurities of the physical body, just reducing them to ashes. It's only when this head is placed on that altar, when the submitted will is placed on that altar, when our feet are consecrated to our kingdom commission and placed on the altar, which is also your inclination to run to do evil. You heard that in scripture before? Some people don't just walk to do mischief, they run to it. If they hear something bad's going on, they hear a shred of a derogatory conversation, they're going to run down the hall to get in on it and hear the, the dirt and the gossip and the juice. We want to put that behind us, wash our feet, and put those up on the altar with the head, with the will. We want to burn off that toxic waste of sin in our kidneys and our liver. 
We want to burn up the desire for excess, to lay up kingdoms for ourselves instead of sharing it with others. Only when you've done these things, only when you've put these animal parts of you on the brazen altar, can you even hope to walk into the golden altar of incense and to the holy place, the Holy Spirit place. It's a high calling. You walk into that place where the golden altar is, you had better be purified in your heart. It's a place of discipleship, a place of apostleship, of consecration, of sanctification. And in order to do it, you know what? You might have to leave your family and your personal aspirations behind. See, Aharon wasn't even allowed to grieve over his sons. You want to be a priest? You sit there and you eat that meal. As bitter as it is to you. And how many of you have left family, friends, career choices, business decisions behind so that you could keep God's fiery Torah? But you can't bypass it. You've got to do that first because too many times your family won't be submitted to where they can go with you to the golden altar of incense. They're okay. They're right there at the brazen altar. Don't worry about them. They're in the courtyard. If they found Yeshua, they have found the altar of our sacrifice. But they have not necessarily found the golden unity of the body. And if you want to go back and get that tape, it's... Um, be brazen, be gold, where I explain the symbols of the two altars. But this golden altar, remember, has to be ignited from the coals of the brazen altar. It takes you burning that flesh in order for you to even be able to ignite the fire in the Holy Spirit place on the golden altar. If you bypassed it, where are you going to get your ashes? You're going to be bringing in strange fire. If you're not willing to humble yourself, at the brazen altar and give up the kingdoms of men to take upon yourself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. Because remember the blood of the atonement was sprinkled in that holy place. It was sprinkled in the holy of holies. Except now we're, we have a much higher calling because we're not dealing with animal blood. We are dealing with the blood of Yeshua sprinkled in that holy place. Ananias and Sapphira know that now. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied in that Holy Spirit place. They approached presumptuously. And the blood of Messiah is no less important to us. We cannot trample underfoot the blood of Messiah in that Holy Spirit place and chalk it up to just getting caught up in the moment. That's what happened to Nadav and Avihu. They got caught up in the moment. What is strange fire? Strange fire is usurping authority. At the time when the instructions were given, it was understood that Aaron would offer the fragrant incense. His sons would inherit in due time, but while he was alive, as long as he was alive, Aaron was to offer the golden altar incense. But Nadav and Avihu were over-anxious. They wanted to inherit now. And they rushed right ahead of their father. And it caused them, maybe it was covetousness. Maybe they wanted that privilege. But they were not yet appointed this task of offering the incense which was specifically designated to Aaron. Also, they offered it at the wrong time. See, their timing was off too. It was not the time for the lighting of the menorah. That's when you offered the incense. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the consequence was not good. They sinned by taking upon themselves to make a judgment concerning the Torah of offering incense. They made a decision without consulting their teacher Moshe or their father, the high priest. It was disrespect to Aaron and Moshe. It was strange fire. And while they knew that that spiritual authority rested upon their father and their uncle, they neglected to follow the instructions. They reinterpreted the instructions to suit themselves. It was the fire of their own ambition that was strange. Had they done it correctly, it would not have been strange fire. Had it been Aaron, it's not strange. But you do something that is opposed to God's word and it will become strange fire to him. If they had been patient, they would have inherited that privilege in due time. 
and it would have saved their lives had they been patient. But they did not stop and offer those ulterior motives on the brazen altar, the, the motives of the flesh. And if you would go back and you would read Exodus 19.22, you would see that even the priests were instructed not to break through the mountain. The mountain represents the Torah, the instructions. Even a priest is not supposed to break through and disobey the instructions. He said, lest I break out upon them. Well, they broke out with strange fire and he broke right back out on them. And the judgment fell. And this is mirrored by Korach and his rebellion. Remember, Korach challenged Moshe and he said, the whole congregation is holy. We're all holy. We can all do this. He didn't want Moshe to make the rules or benefit from them. Well, if we are a kingdom of priests, they're saying, then let us decide what we're doing. We're just going to take this over, Moshe. But what they did is they took a scripture that said the whole nation is holy. They abused it. They twisted it so that it would fit their agenda. But you know what? 